Here you are again, prepared to turn the page. You know the risk and know the danger. Let us begin. In the small snow flurries, Nick drove around the last switchback and went to the mountain village of Fort Elder. It wasn't really a fort now, but during the American Western expansion period, frontiersmen had posted a small walled bastion. There was a pass between a pair of peaks in the Rocky Mountains. There, the old pioneers had built a road and set up their fort. Now, it was a modern ski resort town. People came from all over the country to slide down the slopes in whatever form suited their fancy. Nick had his snowboard and a week's worth of clothing and supplies in the back of his SUV. He made annual snowboarding trips up into the mountains as soon as the first frosts of the year hit the country. The slopes called to him, and Nick answered every chance he got. Fort Elder had a few different hotel options, and Nick had picked the Grand Hartwood Lodge. It cost more per night than some others, but it had its own ski area with various slopes ranging from green circles to black diamond ratings. It was all on the property. That would give Nick the most time and he wouldn't have to fight as many crowds. He passed the Fort Elder welcome sign. Under it, there was a smaller sign. It read, tune radios to AM 620 for weather updates on the mountain. Nick thumbed the dial over to the right station. The orbital reports worsening conditions on the southern edge of Fort Elder. Not to worry though, the reported storm looks like it will blow right on past without impacting the roads. Residents are warned, however, to watch out for buildup of snow on power lines as this could cause blackouts. The town council has approved modernizing the obsolete snow plows, but it is too late for this year's snowy season. Make sure you have... Nick clicked the radio back off. He heard what he needed to hear. A storm was rolling in, but it wouldn't keep him off the slopes. He thought of the fresh, untouched snow, and grinned as he pulled off the winding mountain road and down onto Fort Elder's main street. There were already drifts on both sides of the street, even though it was early in the year. That was a good sign. Nick checked the GPS directions on his phone and followed them across town and up the northern mountainside. When he finally caught his first glimpse of the Grand Hartwood Lodge through the flurries on his windshield, Nick knew he had picked the right hotel. It looked large and well built. There was a covered drive for him to unload his bags regardless of the weather, and he could see a massive fire going in the lobby through the equally sized windows. Nick checked in easily enough, and as the sun began moving towards twilight, he took his bags up to his room. It didn't take him long to unpack. The week ahead looked like it was going to be the best one yet. With a few bills burning a hole in his pocket, Nick walked back down the stairs, past the lobby, and slid onto a stool at the long bar. The fire was going behind him. His drive was over, and he had a lovely bartender giving him smiles. Tonight, life was good. Your glass looking a little low there. You need me to top you off? The bartender asked. Nick looked up from his map and gave her a thumbs up. The woman moved over and refilled his whiskey. My name's Laura. Just call if you want another round. She smiled at him, and Nick returned it. He took a sip of the drink and the sharp bite of the cheap booze stung his throat. He didn't let it show on his face. Not in front of the cute bartender. <clears throat> I'll let you know. Nick replied, hearing the ghost of the sharp drink tainting his voice. Laura must have heard it too because she turned her smile into a one-sided smirk. You know there are smoother options available. <clears throat> this is fine for now. She shrugged. Suit yourself, Laura said, moving back along the bar to one of the other patrons. The whiskey was doing its job, and the fire in the lobby behind him warded off the chill of the open doors. Excitement would have to wait. Nick wanted to make a plan for the next morning's activities. He looked back down at the map in his lap picking it up and laying it open on the bar. He saw a starlight version of the town. It marked the two roads into and out of the village, as well as all the smaller roads up into the mountains. Nick guessed hikers came in the droves during the summer months to climb all over the dark rocky mountain. 
Along the top of the map, Nick spotted the great artwood. Above that, there were many smaller dotted lines noting the different slopes and which ski lifts Nick should take to access them. He figured he would get warmed up on a shorter route in the morning, then maybe come back to the lodge for lunch, and Laura's phone number. Without taking his eyes from the map, Nick took another sip of the cheap whiskey. He grimaced at its bite. But then the alcohol's wonder grabbed him, and he felt everything's rough edges smooth out. Maybe he would try to get Laura's number tonight. Maybe he would go straight on to the big slope tomorrow. He could do it. Nick had done it before. Uh, maybe the whiskey's giving me more than a little extra courage. Uh, maybe I should head to bed before it gets me in trouble. He slowed his thoughts down and focused on the snow outside. It was coming in more steadily now. The small flurries from earlier were gone, and a real heavy accumulation had built up. Nick could just make out the parking lot as a single white sheet through the windows looking out into the dark. There was almost no wind now, and the flakes drifted aimlessly to the ground. Virgin snow sounded good. Nick dropped some cash on the bar, chugged the last of his whiskey with another grimace, and headed out to his room. When he came down the next morning bright and early, Nick only had a minor hangover. He needed something to eat, and greasy food cured his hangovers better than anything else. He slid back into the same bar stall as the night before, and pulled a menu towards him. You're up already? Nick rubbed his temple with one hand, the other still holding the menu. Mm, and you're still here. When does your shift end? Hmm? Laura just shrugged. What looks interesting? She asked, ignoring his question. Nick ordered his breakfast and excused himself back to his room while the kitchen cooked it up. A few minutes later, he came back, wearing his gear and with his snowboard in his hand. Nick draped the jacket over the empty bar stool next to him. It was too hot outside to wear it inside. Someone must have kept the fire going all night because it looked like fresh wood on the stones of the hearth. His greasy bacon and waffles appeared a moment later, and Nick dove into them without reservation. The light pouring in from the windows to the side of the bar was blinding. It bounced up, reflecting from the snow covering the ground. Nick squinted through his hangover as he thanked her. If I were you, I'd get on the slopes pretty soon. There's a storm coming in this afternoon. You'll want to be back indoors by then. <laughs> How bad's it going to be? Who knows? It's always a gamble up here. Fort Elder's not the most forgiving town around with the weather. If you get trapped inside, call me. I'm sure we can find something to do. Laura said, and scribbled her number down on a napkin. The ski lift was fast. Nick made it up to the green circle slope soon after breakfast. He had Laura's number tucked safely away in an inside pocket of his jacket. It wouldn't do for him to lose it on the way down. He glanced up at the sky, spotting the beginnings of more snowflakes whispering their way toward the ground. There was still no wind. Nick snapped his feet into the snowboard, put his goggles down over his eyes. There were only four or five other people he had seen since leaving breakfast. All of them had seemed to be on similar paths up the lifts like Nick. With a slow steadying breath, he turned his feet, bent his knees and leaned into the front of his board. And then, like all good things in life, the rush took away all his worries. It was glorious and freeing. He slid left and right, cut inward and turned out. The snow was pristine and its flawless surface gave Nick more speed and control than he had had on any of the slopes he had gone down in years. When he had made it to the bottom, the only thought in Nick's mind was on how quickly he could get back up to go on a longer one. He knew the one he wanted. Nick had picked it out last night at the bar, but as he approached the lift, he saw a man dressed in a black jacket, stopping anyone from going up the mountain. Sorry, sir. The weather's changing, and the storm is moving in sooner than predicted. We're sorry for the inconvenience, but for your safety. No more patrons can go until the storm passes. His name tag read Antonio. Uh, how long is the storm expected to last? We do not know, sir. I'm sorry. But I insist you return to the lodge. We will announce it where we can reopen the slopes. Antonio answered. Nick seethed. He only got a single run, and there wasn't even that much snowfall yet. 
there was still time for him to make another run. Damn what the staff said. He stomped off into the main lobby. Keeping an eye out, he watched the lifts as they ground to a halt, and the last skis returned to the bottom. Shortly after that, Antonio left his post. Nick didn't wait another second. He raced out the doors and into the snow. The grey clouds were moving in now, but there was still time. He could at least get a little more time on the mountain. Nick clicked the lift's controls back on and hopped onto the closest bench. Even if they caught him and stopped the lift, he would just jump out and start from there. It wouldn't hurt him in the least if he jumped out. In the end, Nick shouldn't have worried. The bench never stopped rising, and he made it back to the top of the slope. He could clearly still see his own tracks in the snow from his last run down the mountainside, but they wouldn't last much longer. The snow was really coming down now, and the great clouds moved almost directly overhead. The wind picked up and tossed the loose powder up into Nick's eyes. He dropped his goggles back in place and took off while he still could. With the wind and the abandoned route, the ride was even better than the first time. But when he reached the bottom, the storm had darkened the sky and visibility was reducing. It wouldn't be safe to do it again. Nick took his free ride as a win and went back inside. The fire was still going strong, once again with fresh logs, and Nick warmed his fingers up with its heat. He casually looked around to see who else was still in the lobby. The place looked abandoned. He couldn't believe it. Nick had gotten away with his little stunt completely unnoticed. He grinned to himself at his own cleverness. Well, now that I'm stuck inside for a while, maybe it's time to keep the party going. He reached inside his jacket and pulled Laura's number out. She wasn't at the bar, and neither was anyone else. Nick strode over and sat down on the same stool as the first two times. He reached over the wooden top and snatched the bottle of whiskey from the previous evening. It was close enough he didn't even need to move from his seat. Then, grabbing a glass sitting upside down from a neat little row in front of him, Nick poured himself some of the harsh liquid. Nick was still smiling as he typed Laura's number into his cell phone and hit dial. After a few seconds, his smile faded. The phone beeped at him several times, and looking at the screen, he could see why. The storm must have knocked out the cell reception. I guess I can't win them all. Nick figured since no one was around to stop him, he would just keep on working to the bottom of the whiskey bottle. Maybe Laura would turn up before he ran out, and they could share the end of it. Not once did an ounce of worry tickle the back of Nick's mind. But what he didn't know was his stunt coming back up the mountain had saved his life. Hey, you! The man's voice called from across the lobby. It sounded like he was from somewhere in Europe. Nick turned in his seat to look over his shoulder at the man. Yeah? He asked. He didn't hide the irritation in his voice. That man was not who he had hoped would come looking for him. Where is everyone? The man asked. Nick shrugged. <sighs> who cares? I'm on vacation and this looks like an open bar. What's your name? He asked. Nick pegged the accent was from somewhere in Ireland. I'm Nick. You? Quinn O'Connell, he replied. Well, cheers to you, Mr. O'Connell. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep working on this bottle, since I can't get out on the mountain. Wait, what are you doing here? Don't you know what's going on? Nick sighed. This man was clearly intent on spoiling the mood. No, I haven't seen anyone. I don't care either way. Quinn slid onto the bar stool next to Nick and pulled something out of his pocket. Nick hadn't ever seen anything like it before. It was some kind of device with wires hooked up to a large crystal shard of some greenish glass. There was a tiny speaker attached to the other end of the wires. It let out a subtle crackling static and a slow repeating pattern. Uh, what is that? Nick asked, pointing at the strange device. Well, Quinn said, frowning. I don't rightly know. A scary beaked fellow gave it to me. The only thing he said was that the louder it got, the better. <laughs> it's not loud right now, Nick replied, taking another sip of his drink. I did mention he was scary, right? Good for him. It was most decidedly bad news for us. Mm, I think I've had just about enough craziness for one morning. Have fun with your device, Nick said. He stood up from the bar, grabbed his board, and made his way back to the lobby on his way to the stairs before Quinn called after him. Hey, if bad stuff starts happening, 
I'll be in room 12. Nick kept walking. Whatever you say, buddy. Nick turned the key in the lock and walked back into his room. He lowered his snowball to the ground and leaned it against the wall. Next, he shuffled out of his heavy jacket and let it fall into the entry area. The hotel furnished the room as most rustic hotel rooms he had seen. It all looked the same to him after a while. Something was off, though, and Nick couldn't quite place it from his peripheral vision alone. It didn't click until he finally looked up and paid attention. The covers on his bed were wrapped up in a pile on the floor, and the door to the bathroom stood ajar. There was some scent in the air, metallic and tangy. Nick moved further into the room to pick up the roll of blankets, but as soon as he touched them, he could tell something was inside it. A warning sense prickled, and Nick yanked his hand away. Where were you, Nick? You were supposed to be here. Everyone was supposed to be in their rooms. Nick spun around to see Antonio standing in the glow of the bathroom's light, the sink on behind him creating a curtain of noise. What are you doing? Get out of my room! Nick said, a tremor in his voice. I think the housekeeper didn't do a very good job on the sheets, did she? The whiskey Nick had drank slowed his reaction time. Antonio shot forward and had a scalpel against his throat before Nick could even comprehend what was happening. You were supposed to be here. I accounted for all the guests. Nick hadn't ever been in a situation like this before, and despite its gravity, his first response was to laugh. His body had a strange reaction to stress. Your math must be really terrible then, because there's a wild guy with a green rock downstairs and he- You lie. Antonio cut him off. Nick felt a slight burning sensation in his throat and knew this maniac could cut him. It felt minuscule, but the feeling sobered him instantly. It wasn't the smartest thing he could have done, and it could have ended badly for him. But in that second of panic, Nick lashed out and elbowed Antonio in the stomach. He knocked the air from the man's lungs. Antonio dropped the scalpel and clutched at his chest. Nick sprang forward out of reach. You seem to have dislodged something, Antonio said. Oh, Elias will enjoy you. It has been so long since he's had an experiment that fought back. Ripping open the door, Nick charged out of the room and down the hallway. Antonio's sing-song voice called after him. Look. At the little rat run. My monsters are going to have such fun. Don't worry, little mouse. There's nowhere we can't find you in our big house. Nick leaped down the stairs, caught himself against the wall on the landing and leaped again down the next flight. His legs were tight from the morning's workout on the slope, but it didn't hinder him in the slightest. Fear made Nick forget about it all. As strange as Quint had been, he was the only other person who'd been around. Room 12 was just down the hall now. He was close. And then he heard the howls. There were canines and worse. They echoed around the walls from inside the lodge. Nick rounded a corner between the two wings of the lodge. Quinn was heading the other way, glassy rock in hand. The two almost ran straight into each other. Nick was panting from trying to escape and the trickle of blood coated the collar of his shirt. Quinn pointed at the stain with his free hand. That have anything to do with this thing going off like a Geiger counter at Chernobyl? Nick didn't have to answer. The howls did it for him. They both turned towards the sounds and saw two shaggy black wolves scratching their claws into the wood flooring. Their lips curled up, showing their teeth, and one let out a sharp bark. Their eyes, though, their eyes were wild and filled with bloodlust, but there was something off about them. They were human eyes. The bar called out to others, and not other walls. The response came immediately. Malformed things, half human and half animal, crawled out from every room in the lodge. Nick jumped back into the center of the hallway as the door next to him opened. The animal parts were from the same species, even. It was as though an anatomist had taken notes on ancient Greek monsters and put their own spin on it. This work would have taken months to prepare. It would have been impossible to keep the secret for so long. Where are the owners? Nick whispered to Quinn. We have security! We might be looking at them. You ready to run? Nick thought back to all he had seen since he had arrived. There were a few guests, but not many. Not nearly this many. There were dozens of deformed monsters all staring at the pair of them now with their human eyes. Then they all turned their head in acknowledgement 
as Antonio walked calmly around the corner. I see you've woken up by the experiment. What did you think of them? I'm trying to decide which one is the most efficient, but honestly those aren't particularly the most fun to watch. We've got to get out of here. We've got to save whoever we can. Quinn whispered again, ignoring Antonio. His voice was calm and even. Nick supposed it was for the monster's benefit and not his. Neither of them wanted the creatures agitated. Nick wasn't sure how much control Antonio held over them, but he had the feeling the man didn't really want to control them. How about we save ourselves first? You ever think of that? Nick answered. Antonio hadn't been idle while the two whispered to one another. He had moved through the ranks of the monstrous creatures, inspecting them with a professional eye and the gentle touch of a parent. Finally satisfied, he turned to one tall woman beside him. He looked her up and down, inspecting his work. She was still mostly human form, but had antlers affixed to her head. Antonio had covered her mouth with an armored bark, as though from trees on the mountain. He had done the same to her arms, giving them sharp woody ridges up past her elbows. A thick fur covered her front, heavy and brown. She stood taller than Antonio, but hunched forward. He turned to her, and in a silken voice said, Kill them for me, would you? And with that simple command, from somewhere deep within her, she let out a bellow like a horn that resonated in Nick's head and turned his courage to water. He turned and ran, Quinn next to him and all the monsters close behind. Where are we going? Nick asked, nearly breathless as they sprinted down the hall. We're looking for a mechanism. Something is controlling the storm, harnessing it to speed up their experiments. We've got to break it, Quinn said. The pair rounded a corner into the lobby, and Nick knocked a pile of brochures to the ground as he passed. It probably wouldn't help, but it didn't hurt either. And how do you know that? Let's just say a little bird tipped me off before I got here. And you intentionally came here? I'm running away from monsters with a crazy person! Gleeful howls came from somewhere on their right. Both the men rounded an enormous tree trunk that held the roof aloft. Nick held a finger up to his lips in a signal to keep quiet, but he needn't have bothered. Quinn was equally quiet, but as soon as the howling monsters entered the room, the green device chirped and let out a rhythmic static pulse. Quinn locked eyes with Nick, and he said the only thing that made sense in that moment. Oh, fuck. A fibrous tendril wrapped around the tree trunk above their heads, and walls skittered around to the far side, yipping and banging. Nick wished he had a snowboard with him because at least then he would have something to swing and defend himself with. Instead, he acted out immediately on wild impulse. The creatures didn't have thousands of years of evolution to perfect their forms. Antonio had stitched them together in macabre surgeries, and somehow they lived through it. Nick didn't understand half of what was going on, but he guessed a few of them didn't have the best balance. He charged them as they moved towards him, shoving the first aside, a short man with overlarge pincers on his face and arms. Nick broke through the circling mop. He ran out of the lobby and into the snow outside. The wind bit at his cheeks, but he didn't care. He looked down at the town and under a blanket of constantly falling snow. There were no lights on in the town below him. Left! Quinn called from behind him. Somehow the strange man had made use of Nick's distraction to escape as well. There, in the outbuilding. It's got power. That has to be it. The woman appeared in the doorway and raised her hand, pointing at them. There. Nick heard the call inside his head. They are there. Track them. Nick's brain fizzed under the psychic assault, and he only just pulled himself back to his surroundings as the monsters bounded after him. Quinn was already moving, and had wrenched open the door on the lit building. He disappeared inside without a backwards glance, just a call for Nick to hurry. Nick made it, but by a fingernail. The walls were fast, but the other creatures, indescribable ones, were faster. They ripped the door from its hinges as Nick spun around to climb the heavy stairs inside. There were three floors of spiraling steps before he bounded through an open door. A man stood opposite Quinn, his hand holding a dagger against Laura's throat. Everything came to a stop then. Quinn didn't stand idly. He yanked hard on a group of thick wires coming from the wall into an immense machine dominating the center of the room. Tell him to stop, 
the man called to Nick. The monsters are right behind us. Help me, Quinn pleaded. We have to shut this down. But what about Laura? She's with them. She's their mastermind. Nick, help me. Please, you have to help me. He was supposed to be on a vacation like he had gone on a dozen times before. This was supposed to be the best week of the year, but it was a waking nightmare. Nick stood in the middle of the room, unable to decide. Finally, he shook his head and pushed Quinn over and away from the wires. What are you doing? The monsters will be up here in seconds. Nick ignored him, instead turning back towards the man holding Laura. There! Let her go! The man smiled, shrugged, and removed the dagger from Laura's throat before throwing her away from him. Turn the machine back on, please, he said. No! I don't know what's going on here, but we've got to escape! There are things out there! He pointed to the open door leading to the stairs. He could hear them climbing the steps, and hoped the large creatures were not agile on the twisting stairs. I wasn't speaking to you. Ah, oh, yes, of course, brother, Laura said, and kicked Quint free of the tangle of wires. What? Nick asked, unable to comprehend what was happening. Nick, run! Quint called. He moved further into the room, making for a door leading away from the machine. Nick didn't move in time. Laura, eldest of the family of pestilence, and the mistress of horror, watched in glee as thick tendrils wrapped around Nick's neck dragging him on his feet. Antonio stepped into the room alongside two walls. Now, let's see which of these pets works the fastest. Their older brother, Elias, sheathed his dagger and pulled a lever to restart the machine as soon as Laura had finished plugging all the wires back in. The lights flickered on once, and then the machine coughed before coming back to life. Everything seemed to freeze for a moment. The wolves ripped into Nick's chest with their fangs. He screamed. And then, an explosion drowned out everything else in the room. Quinn had placed his jade spike into the machine. Its constant static noise unnoticed in the cacophony of it coming back to life. The energy flew through it, and the power within detonated. Finally, sending the three siblings onward to another experiment in death. The lights in the town of Fort Elder came back on almost immediately and the monsters, devoid of their animating force, slumped to the ground. Quinn extracted himself from the rubble and trudged off through the snow to continue his search for the mortis. Welcome back to Act Two of Mortis Maledictum. I know it's been a long wait, but our little team of Malusi has had to grow somewhat to meet the demands of the stories put upon us. You see, it's really taken on a life of its own and now, well, now it needed a few more sacrifices into the void. So please, welcome Rosie Knuckles and Gorath Hewn to the Black Fire and the Plain of Ash and the Biting Hail. I hoped you liked meeting them in this episode and you're going to hear a lot more out of them soon. Additionally, because Mortis Maledictum has quite the long production schedule, we've decided to fill those long gaps with more stories. Side stories, if you will. We hope you like them just as much as the main affair. This episode of Mortis Maledictum, The Hunting Call, was narrated by Jeremiah Johns. Voiced by Jeremiah Johns, Gorath Hewn, Rosie Knuckles, and Vidi St. Martin. Audio design was by Lawrence Lydens. It was written by Devin McCamey, with the artwork courtesy of Brandon McCamey. Thank you for listening. And if you want to find out more about the world of Mortis Maledictum or to read ahead, just visit us at our website, www.mortismaledictum.com. Thus, the story is ended. The tale told. The chapter closed.